I got a question for you, and I'll take this out if you don't want to talk about it. Um, but having worked on Angel, what did you feel or how have you felt about everything that has come out about the creator of Angel? It's tricky. It's really tricky. Welcome back to the Comics Cube, everyone. I am with Scott Tipton. How are you? How's it going, sir? So, Scott, I'm going to say something that I only told a few people. Um, when I started my website back in 2010, you were the primary inspiration. Really? Yeah. It was you um, and Bill Simmons, who has nothing to do with comics. So <laughs> it's like, I'm like, all right, well, people can do this whole thing where they just talk about comics all they want, then, then I'm going to do it too. And that was basically you. It was basically, great, ironically, man. your Starman series that got me that got me into it. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's fantastic to hear. I mean, the the only bad thing about writing for the internet a lot is that much like writing for comics, you're just throwing this stuff out in the void. And you, you never know if it's having an effect on people. Sometimes they write in, and that's great. You get emails, but you never really know if you if you, if what you're doing even has any impact. So anytime you hear that somebody was affected by what you're writing and what you're doing. That's the best thing ever. What do you, why do you love comics? I have always loved comics. I can't remember a time in my life when comics weren't a big part of it. Uh, my dad bought comics when he was a kid. His dad owned a restaurant during World War II. And my dad would read comics and then sell them to the servicemen going off to war before they went off, went off, went off to the ships. So my dad, every, every giant Golden Age comic passed through my dad's hands as a kid before it went off to the to the Pacific Theater. And so as a, as a result, comics were always welcome in my house growing up because my dad had this love for him too. So I, 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 there, were, there was always giant stacks of comics in the house. I can't remember a time it wasn't a huge part of my life. If you can't remember a time it wasn't a huge part of your life, you must also not remember what your first comic was. I remember the, well, I remember the first comic I remember buying. It was at the local Rexall, and it was a. I don't want I, if if I, if Chris Rao were here, he'd know the issue number. But it was an issue of Spidey Super Stories with Iceman on the cover. Ah, uh, that I remember. Don't worry, we'll look that up. That's why the internet exists, you know. <laughs> exactly. And yeah, as far as as far as knowledge of coming, one of my first memories is like watching Batman, Adam West Batman, mm. and being entranced by it and from that point out my parents are like hey he likes batman and then i would start getting the books and the comics and the toys and so that's kind of that's kind of where it all started was adam west where do you stand on adam west now he's the best batman ever i agree <laughs> you know i mean it's not the other batman that aren't good i i just saw the most recent one i liked it a lot but he's but adam west is batman i was having this conversation with some friends last night because we all had just seen the batman and i said um Somebody who doesn't read comics asked how comic accurate it was. And I said, the most comic accurate live action Batman to the comics it's trying to portray is Adam West. Oh, no question. Right? It's not a contest. I, mean, I think that first Riddler episode basically just takes it page by page. Uh, all, even, even the death traps are the ones for that were in the comic. It, the, the, absolutely so. And, you know, it's, it's like Adam West is a straight out of a Dick Sprang book, right? Yeah, oh, hundred percent. I mean, to the point where their their Gotham City is a Gotham populated by giant birthday cakes and giant typewriters. You know, it's 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 all there. But what got me the most, and I didn't really realize this until a few years ago when they finally put out the big Blu-ray box set where you got the whole series, and I got to really dive back into it because at this point it's been off syndication, been not easily accessible for like twenty years. Because as a kid, it was dead serious to me. It was there. It was not a comedy. Batman was Batman was like was like NYPD Blue or The Godfather. It was serious. I was involved, but now I go back and watch it, and it's hilarious. Yes, and, and intentionally so. It's it's not cringe comedy. They're they're trying to do a comedy that also works as adventure, and they're pulling it off. Adam West's delivery on those lines is just killer, and he doesn't get enough credit as being a great comedic actor as he should. No, it's because he he. He doesn't deliver them as if he's laughing at them. That was the problem with George Clooney. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, even as, as you know, as as 
unattached as Val Kilmer felt as Batman. At least you got the sense that he was taking it seriously. Yeah. But Clooney never stopped, never stopped winking at the camera. Now, in Clooney's defense, he was being given stuff like the Batman credit card to hold up the camera. So it wasn't as if he had a lot to work with in that movie. But you're right. That Clooney never took it seriously. See, Adam West would have pulled that off. Oh, he totally, yeah, he absolutely <laughs> would have. <laughs> yeah. 100%. There's that one line from, uh, well, there are many lines from uh, the 1966 Batman movie that that he that Adam West delivers perfectly. But one of them is like, um, well, what is it like? What do you call? What is light? It flies and dangerous. A sparrow with a machine gun. A machine gun. Correct. <laughs> the <laughs> only possible answer. The only possible answer. <laughs> Or I think whether when they, whenever they the, they bust in presumably to to kidnap Miss Kitka and he's like you twisted evil fiends <laughs> oh, that's, that's the best <laughs> or or uh, my absolute favorite scene in that movie is when they figure out all four of the villains yeah, see yeah. <laughs> see for Catwoman it's like really that seems like a reach even for me Robin let's go back to the drawing board now. First well, three, I'll give you. <laughs> well, you see, the giant rubber shark was pulling my leg. Yeah, it's a joke. Joke. <laughs> oh, what a great time. Uh, do you remember the first creators you fell in love with? The first creators I, active, I actively remember following were probably, probably Roger Stern and Mark Grunewald. Mm. Grunewald especially just because I got I got to know Grunewald personally and he was like my contact at Marvel for years really because I, I was a I, I was a big time letter hack back in the day if you go look at copies of Solo Avengers and Avengers and West Coast Avengers and Flash and Secret Origins there's letters from me all over those things mm. and so uh, back then Marvel used to go always faithfully go to WonderCon in Oakland which is like my closest big convention and I started going. I started going to WonderCon, and I would go by the Marvel booth, and, and the groom all immediately saw my badge and recognized my name, and we got to know each other pretty well. And so every year I'd come up with like my my Ant Man comic that I just bought, and every year he asked me what I thought of this of this this year's Avenger books, and we got to be really close. And and such the, that uh, the plan was uh, so when I graduated college, I was going to move out to New York and work at Marvel for him. And then that was right whenever the industry kind of burst, the 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 the, uh, the collectors bubble burst, and all of a sudden Marvel was going into bankruptcy, yeah. and that was the year I was about to get into the job market. He's like, "Look, I don't even know about my job." And so he's like, "Let's let's convene for a couple of years." And I'm like, "Yeah, that makes sense." So I moved to LA and got into advertising, and then the next year he passed away from that massive massive and unexpected heart attack, and yeah, that kind of quashed cool. my desire to work at comics for like a decade. Instead, I devoted myself. I was working in advertising and just doing other stuff. But Grunewald was the guy that really, because I, I got pulled in by Grunewald's uh, uh, President Fires Cat storyline. And that was the first thing I remember where like, I had the poster on my wall from, from that. I got at WonderCon that year. And that was when I really started. I really kind of, like, this is the guy that now I was following Grunewald on his other stuff, his Hawkeye series, his Squadron Supreme. That was, that was kind of my first connection into the fact that these guys, the, 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 there, there are people who are working in comics and this is a thing you could do. In fact, I mean, I think the best part is one day I've been, been, I've been letter hacking for about a year or two and I've had letters published in a bunch of books, a lot of them by Grunewald. And one morning, I think I was in either, I think it was my freshman year or sophomore year of high school. And the phone rings on the way out the door. And my mom picks it up and says, hey, it's for you, it's Mark. Got a buddy named Mark. So she thought I was Mark because that's how he did herself. And it's Mark Grunewald. I'm like, hey, Mark. And at this point, we'd never met or talked or anything. This was like my introduction to the man. And he's like, I just want you to know I've got Mark Bright sitting here in my office and I'm making him erase all of the arrows in this issue of Solo Avengers so he can redraw them with the notches in the back. And I'm like, no. And I remember I'd written a letter. And I, you know, when, when you're 16 years old and you think you're a smart ass, this is what you write about. I was complaining that all of the arrows in the issue didn't have a notch that you put the, the bowstring in and that there was no way to fire these arrows. And that's what passes for wit when you're 16. And so he was making Mark re 
draw every arrow. And I guess I guess he just just did the did the, the legwork back then. Found a, a, a public phone book from three thousand miles away and decided to call me and hassle me about. It. How do you feel about that now? Like, is oh, that something you would ever. even would you? Is that something you would even notice now? Oh, you mean the the, the, the knocks near? Yeah, I would. Those arrows were like bowling pins in those panels, and they're just smooth on the back. I wouldn't notice. <laughs> yeah, I think you can tell with a lot of uh, artists in the pre Google search era, not even the pre internet yeah. era, just the pre Google. Well, yeah, and yeah, to be fair, I mean, you, you didn't have the wealth of resources you did back then. Yeah, now if, if you, you just draw that wrong, it's like, come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and everybody would know right now. If, if you're a guy back then. How often, how many people know that much about archery? How many people were that involved in it? it, 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 it again, it didn't really matter, but I would just, the fact that he called me was, just, was, was hilarious. What about Roger Stern? Stern was on his big Avengers run at the time. Oh my God. And it was that, that, that period uh, starting around, it's, it's all happened around the same time as Secret Wars. And you had the, you had like the fall of Hank Pym because I'd always been a huge Ant-Man fan. You had the fall of Hank Pym and then the kind of his redemption. And then that led right into the vision. And then the division like leading the team and taking over. And then from that it went right into especially under siege, which was a crazy. I mean, Stern built up that for a year where he had all the pieces in place. And it was kind of the Avengers at their weakest. And even when they the the strong, the strong um facets they had like Hercules he built in like months in advance to get them taken out of the game and it was that I, I could not remember the time a more a, a tenser comic to read that the period whatever whatever the the masters of evil totally bust in and take over the Avengers mansion and I and there's no internet back then so you don't know where things are going you can't look at covers three months in advance so you're just you get an issue and then you're you're just racked for four weeks. It was yeah. great. I miss that. I, yeah. I that's the thing I miss most about comics these days is the complete radio silence between issues. Yeah, I have to actively not look at uh, <laughs> solicits yeah. and previews. Yeah. Yeah. Um the, th the thing about Under Siege too is like it's such a legendary story, and you hear a lot of Avengers fans saying things like, Oh, they should adapt that into into the mcu and i'm like i don't think they can because it's well not they couldn't do it before now they probably could do it because like you you have to build that up right yeah you can't see you can't do that even in like your second or third avengers movie because the reason under siege worked so well is it was at that point i mean the avengers mansion had been uh uh just a, a, a load-bearing wall for the marvel universe for like 25 years and so it's just seeing them just devastate the place and seeing poor Jarvis just get terrorized and Cap made to watch and like Mr. Hyde crushing Cap's shield in front of him. All these things that were like that you, you've known forever if you were like a hardcore Marvel guy. Oh, it was brutal. And like now they could probably do it. But you, you have to put in. And that's also, I mean, that's kind of been the MCU's uh that they've been smart about is they know that for some of these things to have power, you have to build up to them. Yeah. I mean, the, the greatest scene in the, in the entire MCU is the Avengers assemble scene in Endgame. If you do that in movie two, it means nothing. No, it's, it's just, it's just visual noise. I can't but believe they saved films, that for the end game for end game. Yeah. I can't, yeah. I can't believe it. <laughs> after 22 films, that's, that's got gravitas. That means something. Yeah. Right. Yeah, uh, so I remember um, when people were asking for Avengers recommendations, and I was having a really hard time because I'm like, well, first of all, the movie lineup does not exist in the comics. Yeah, it's, it's weird. And it's, it's so weird that, like, if you go into, like, a, a 99 cent store and you buy an Avengers thing, you buy, like, Avengers birthday cake or birthday party stuff, it's those six heads who never actually appeared to give her as the Avengers. Right. And then, you know, a lot of people will suggest things like Under Siege or the Celestial Madonna, which is, like, no, you don't give the Celestial Madonna to when you read her. No, I'm sorry. I, mean, I, I love the Celestial Madonna, but that's kind of a historian's pick. That's going to be somebody who wants a deep cut. You can't, you can't give that to a newbie. Yeah, so my ultimate recommendation is always like, just get Busick Paris Avengers. There you go. That's right. the one. Because it, it's, it, it sells you immediately on the, on the idea of Avengers having a history. Explains enough of it that you need to understand. And then blows it all up and starts doing its own thing. So smart. Everyone is there to begin with. Uh, yeah. What do, 
what did you feel being an Avengers fan? What did you feel getting Busick and Paris on Avengers after not just Heroes Reborn, but many years of, shall I say, not all that great Avengers comics? Yeah, you hear me? Yeah, I, 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 I sense you're speaking of the leather jacket era. <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing says tough like a guy in armor like the Black Knight who then wears a leather jacket over his full plate armor. Don't no, forget that, Hercules. That, yeah. <laughs> That was a terrible run. Um, that Busick Perez era, that was a that was a godsend. So that because but because you know, I, I I had checked out during the whole Teen Tony, um, uh, all the jacket era, and then I was super checked out during during the the life felt and least stuff. Although now I have in, in I think in my old age I developed a fondness for life felt stuff. Just because I, I've got I've gotten to know life a bit at conventions and we've hung out a bit and he is a, he's a good dude and he loves comics and he's so excited about the stuff he does and now I go back and I look at his work that before I didn't even give a second look at and now I can kind of see some I can see some so I, I see a lot of fun stuff there I didn't before but still at the time was, that was not my Avengers book so whenever I heard we were getting getting Busiek and Perez back on Avengers and just to get again this was this was in the, the pre-internet era. So I didn't know it was coming. And you saw that cover with everybody who's ever been an Avenger on it. And then the way they, they lead into the whole thing, oh, that I I can't remember a time when I, when I was more excited about, about Marvel Comics and yeah. the Avengers specifically than, than that run. So I just know, saw today that they're putting out another new omnibus of that run. Yeah. I have the originals. I have the other hardcovers. I'm probably still going to buy that new omnibus too. Yeah, me too. I want to support that. I want I want those guys to get to the paycheck for it because that's great stuff. Yeah, and I I'm my justification is I don't have Avengers Forever. No, oh, there so, you go. Which is a great series. I'm just gonna pick that up. But yeah. What so you're talking about your reaction to the first issue and the cover and everything. How what did you feel when you saw the second issue? And you that, saw, is that, that that's that's the all the all medieval team? Yeah. Oh, that was the best. Because uh, again, uh, it, it all leads back to nostalgia, kind of. And one, uh, a decade or so earlier, one of the first graphic novels, before there were graphic novels, I bought was it was a Marvel's team up thrillers. It was like the one of the last ones they did in their Fireside series, and it was all just various team up books. And one of them was a book I had somehow missed. It was a Spider Man Red Sonia team up. Yeah, and that's the that character is what they used. Was what Kurt used to kick off his Avengers story, and so when I saw that cover with all the with all the new costumes, first thing I thought was, "Oh man, thirty five new Perez Avenger designs! This is great." And then once I got inside and realized, "Oh, he's picking up on cool and goth," and that one story that I remember reading so many times as a kid, it was like it was the best. Uh, where does George rank among your favorite artists? Uh, he's top of the list. I would say I, I would probably tie him with Burn. It's Perez. Really? It's Perez present burn for me that's a that's a comparison that comes up a lot even to me because uh those are the first two names i recognized yeah and and their styles are not that similar really i think it's because they were both so popular and at the same time and both handling very similar projects at the same time that that, that's why they kind of come the and uh i i i don't even i can't even think of a time whenever they worked together on a project really they have what am what, what, what I missing? Action 600. You remember? Ah, okay. um, That's right. That's so, right. So, the one where so, it's so Superman good. and Wonder Woman. George, yeah. um, well, inked Wonder Woman in that whole scene. In that whole That's issue. right. But but George's inks is uh, way tighter than John's pencils. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. And by the cool. way, when I when I say favorite artists, I have to exclude so many of the artists I've gotten to work with. Because that's a whole separate thing. Because <laughs> I've got to work with some some great artists, and uh, uh, that that has has been one of the, the great joys of this of this kind of like unexpected comics career I've had is just getting to actually collaborate with with such great artists. And I will not ask you to rank those guys. <laughs> no, no, please don't. <laughs> On account of uh, I'm a decent and person, I and I want to work with all of them again. So please don't. <laughs> uh, so. Well, where, where was that? So, like, so how did you end up 
you know, starting to work and talk, talking about comics and stuff. Um, it and Kevin Smith? Well, yeah, it, it all came about, it all came about through the Kevin Smith thing, because like I said, after, after Gruenwald passed away, I just kind of, I still read comics, I still love comics as, but as the idea of working in them, I had just, it, it didn't really appeal to me. So I, as I said, I moved to, to LA, I got in advertising and it just so happened that I'm at, in, working in advertising, I met a guy named Chris Ryle, who was working at the same agency as I was. And he started working for Kevin Smith on the Movie Poop Shoot website. Yeah. And he immediately recruited me to come in. Movie Poop Shoot, <laughs> Kevin's not quite as, uh, as, as culturally out there as he was 15 years ago. So for those who remember, in one of Kevin's uh, 90s movies, he 2001, had, actually. 2001, thank you. Yeah. Uh, um, he had, a, it, it was his version of Eating Cool News. It, it was called Movie Poop Shoot. And so that movie came out and then Kevin said he wanted to make it a real site where that was daily entertainment news. He said, I want to just wake up every morning and just go to my own site and get everything I need and get other, and to get content about comics and movies and TV and books and everything. And so he recruited Chris Ryle to run the place. And then Ryle recruited me to come in as the news editor and copy editor. And then I also immediately started uh, doing a weekly column about comics comics 101 with the idea being it's hard to think of it now back and down but back then there was there were almost no comic book movies but they were just starting to happen we we had just had the exit movies at the time it was going on and the reason we started was daredevil the affleck daredevil oh which yeah seems, which seems a lifetime ago now the affleck daredevil was about to come out and so the idea for me doing the column was i'm gonna go see this affleck daredevil movie tell me what daredevil is and so that was the idea behind comics 101 and then I did that every week for the next, um, what, what year is it now? <laughs> was doing that, it every week was that a mandate because Kevin is in that movie? No, no, no honestly, it wasn't. It honestly wasn't. Okay. We, we were actually getting email from people saying, hey, Daredevil's coming out. Uh, tell me about Daredevil. Kevin was very hands-off. With, with, with once, once he set us up, he said, go do it. And we got nothing. We, we got no other mandates from Kevin the whole time we worked for him. But we did that for, I started doing the, the comics for one. And we did that for three solid years. We never missed a day. Every single day for three years, there was new content. Yeah. And that's kind of, I can't kind of credit that where I learned to be, a, to, be, to be a working writer. Because part of my job, besides writing the weekly column and proofreading everything, was I had to do the daily news. And we would, I would pick three to five entertainment news stories, but I would add a wacky headline. So I had to come up with five good jokes, three to five good jokes every day to go with these news stories I'd pick. And I couldn't just say, well, I'm not feeling it today because the news had to go out. So every day I had to be funny. Some days I wasn't as funny as others, but I always had to like get my, get my news stories in. And that kind of like destroyed the idea of a writer's block. We like, there's no writer's block. You just keep writing until you get it. So that's, the, that's where I think I, that came from for me. We did that for three solid years. And then it came about that that the opening for editor-in-chief at IDW opened up and Jeff Marriott recommended Chris based on interviews and conversations they'd have as the guy to go do that. And so Chris jumped to, to IDW and became their editor-in-chief. And, I, and when that happened, I said, look, man, I kind of given up on working in comics. But if something comes along you think I'd be a good fit for, let me know. Maybe I'll try it. We'll see how it goes. And so he'd been, he'd been in a job for a while. And then they had some horror anthologies for adapting Richard Matheson stories. And I said, well, let's try one of these. So I did one of those and it was fun. And I did another one. And then they got the Buffy and Angel license. Yeah. And I wasn't a huge fan, but I knew the show because my girlfriend loved Angel. And, really? and I, she liked Buffy, but she loved Angel. And so my, my, my knowledge of those shows was basically kind of like walking past it as she was watching it and kind of getting it through osmosis. But then whenever that came along, he was like, hey, you want to try and knock out a pitch for, for a, an Angel one shot? And I was like, sure, I love that show. And then I went to Wikipedia, Angel. And I just started reading it. But all right, I can get better on that. So I did. I started doing some, some Angel work. I did a couple of one shots, did a couple of miniseries. And then they got the Trek license. Yeah. And that was where I was like, all right, welcome man. I know I can't just say, please give me the job because everyone's been in line for this job. Just open the door a little. Just let me pitch. If I can get in there and pitch, I think I can get myself in there. 
And that's what he did. He just opened the door up, let me pitch. I pitched for a first series and they really liked it. And so we all ended that first series and we've been working on Trek ever since. Very and cool. I was just, you know, that's, I was like, just, just open the door. All I need is a chance on that one. Uh, yeah, I did, no- I did notice like uh, your credits are pretty much, you know, all licensed comics um, dominated by Trek. You're a big Trek mm-hmm. fan? You're a big Trekkie? Lifetime, lifelong Trek fan. So, yeah, and, the, the, because and because I mean I grew up watching classic and then everything else, next gen and the other and DS9. I watched those as they were new and I, I developed my understanding of those shows as they were happening. So all those shows just just feel so natural to me. We've done some other stuff. And that's a great thing about EW is I've had lots of other fun stuff to work on. I got to do some Astro Boy from when the movie came out. I've gotten to dip my toe into into um. Uh, into Ninja Turtles. I did some Sherlock Holmes with Nicholas Meyer, which was amazing. And I even got uh, the guys at Archie called stuff every now and then to do some of their Crusader stuff. So I even got to do some straight superhero stuff, which is fun. But the Trek stuff is, is really kind of where we live, which is great. You, you've worked with some great artists, too. And, yes, uh, some great artists. We, the, the best thing about IDW has always been that they have a really good eye for young talent that's about to break out, and they give them to me. <laughs> So I'm like, fantastic. So I mean, Miss, we got Miss Cena before he got big. We got Ellen Costa Grande before she was big. We got Rachel Stott before she was big. Uh, J.K. Frizzon. Woodward, uh, was, was, uh, no, he was, uh, he's really going to make a name himself on his track stuff. It's been great. Yo, the uh, the covers to your Illyria series, Jenny Frazan. Which oh, is... God, I've got a Jenny Frazan original in my library thanks to that series. She's amazing. She's amazing. So good. She's so good, yeah. 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 So, what did you have? What have you learned? Uh, well, well, writing comics. Like, what would be the biggest thing that you would have told two thousand six you when it comes to writing comics? Less is more. Stop. Less. No, stop. You stop writing so much. Trust your artist. Let them tell the story as much as you can, and don't cover up so much of their art with your words. I feel so bad now because I, I once I finish a book, it goes on the shelf. I don't look at it again. Spoken like someone who read a lot of Claremont as a kid. Yeah, <laughs> there is definitely Claremont in my veins for 100%. But uh, uh, recently I had to go back and look at the first Trek book I did, which was Blood Will Tell. Okay. And I went back and I looked at it and just every every panel, especially towards the end, the big finale, every the panel, I'll just get this monolith of balloons in the middle of them with all my dialogue covering up so much of, of, of David Messina's gorgeous art. I'm like, oh, what are you doing? Don't do that. Hey, you got, you've got great artists. Trust them to tell the story visually and try and keep your dialogue as much as you can. And it can be tricky with Star Trek because Star Trek requires a lot of techno battle. Yeah. You've got to have a lot. Of, Star Trek is, is, has always been very dialogue heavy, and it should be. But not as heavy as I was for the witches. You know what? It's okay. It happens to everyone. Like we were talking about the Busick Paris Avengers earlier, and yeah. I love Kurt. It's really weird because he doesn't he did, he wasn't doing it in Thunderbolts and or Astro City at the same time. But for some reason, his Avengers with with George is some of the wordiest stuff. I you know I I think again it goes back to the kind of like nostalgia for the comics you read as a kid, and I think when he gets an Avengers, he starts channeling that Steve Englehart. Oh, you know, that could be it. Hey, the, the, this is what Avengers sounds like to him. I was wondering if it, part of it was like him going, "Well, I got George is bringing his A game. I got to bring mine." I think it's probably some of that too, because that, that's gonna be intimidating. Yeah, kids, I'm like. You really don't need to put in no, many words over George, George. Over George. Good, good. Yeah, I, I got lucky. I, uh, I, I have one credit with, with uh, George. He did, uh, he did one cover for my Star Trek Planet of the Apes. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. And they, I remember they told me, and I was like, I get a Perez cover? Really? I was, I was like, the happiest day of my career is getting that Perez cover. So good. And he and just that, he just killed it. And yet, despite all this, you haven't stopped writing about comics. You're still on blast off. You're still yeah, I, I still keep doing my comics one on one thing. I just I, don't, I mean I don't I I I admit I've taken advantage of the fact that I have a close to twenty year backlog of of old columns. So I rotate in a lot more 
re, uh, uh, refreshed columns than I used to because I'm just a lot more busy than I used to be when I read it. You know, that was the only thing I was writing. But yeah, I still there's still something new to read every Wednesday. I, just, I don't know why I, I can't stop doing it. I just, I just, I just can't stop. Because you love comics. Yeah. Uh, it'd be nice comics. to take a break, but I'm not ready yet. Uh, have you ever heard, aside from me, have you ever heard of anybody you know, getting into comics or trying out a new comic based on your recommendation. Oh, for sure. Both of those. I mean, I've actually over the years gotten lots of, lots of comments of people like they just, I'll get a note saying I'm, I'm, I'm halfway through Starman and I can't believe I didn't know about this book, which that's kind of stuff I love. Yeah. And then there are other, there are, there are other people who are like, who are writing comics. I mean, there's a, uh, uh, a guy named Pat Shand who is just, uh, writing comics, writing machine. There was a period there where he was writing like practically every book for Xenoscope. And right now he's doing a tons of his own creator own stuff that he kickstarts. It's, 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 he's, it's a model for a guy who wants to write comics and doesn't really care about life and stuff. It just wants to be writing comics. And he was a guy that just kind of, he was an Angel fan. He reached out to me and asked me some questions and we started talking and I would tell him who to talk to and who not to talk to and how to get, how to get into it. And I mean, I'm not going to claim credit for his success because his success is entirely self-made, but I do, I am proud of the fact that, I mean, the, 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 the he came to me for, for, the, for advice and encouragement and I tried to give him as much as I could. And man, he's run with like crazy. He's doing great. I've got I, love, I, I, I love that. Cause I mean, Mark, you know, Mark Grubel did that for me. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. as much as you can pay it forward, you, you really should. I got a question for you and I'll take this out if you don't want to talk about it. Um, but, having worked on angel what did you feel or how have you felt about everything that has come out about the creator of angel it's tricky it's really tricky um and here's what i'll say because i think i i have a unique perspective on it because of the fact that i am for better or worse i'm linked to that creative output not as much as the people who worked on those actual shows but i'm still a part of that universe and part of my success later on came from that stuff. Here's what I'll say. Um, the stuff you hear about, about Whedon now, uh, it, it's, uh, it's terrible. You, know, you hear about it and there's enough of it from everyone that you, it, as much as you want to say, well, it's just, you know, it's, he said, she said, no, it isn't. I mean, there's a consensus. This, no, because everyone this, is saying. <laughs> yeah, this seems, this is clearly a bad guy. And even when he tries to defend himself, oh, man, it's terrible. whoever was it, Whoever was his advisor who told him to do that last interview, fire that advisor because that was a terrible interview. It did nothing for him. He decided to dig in deep. <laughs> he, he, he totally retrenched. I mean, and, and, I mean, just as a digression, when your defense of the whole justly fiasco is like, well, you know, Ray Fisher was just a terrible actor. But we've all seen Snyder's cut now, and I'm no Snyder fan, really, but Fisher was good in that movie. And the stuff that the stuff that Snyder did with Fisher in that movie was good. So you can't tell me, well, I cut his part down because he was a bad actor when I saw it, and it's not. That was terrible advice. So here's 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 what I say about it: is that nothing that gets made is made in a vacuum, and nothing is made by one person. And even though Whedon is has revealed himself to be something of an odious individual there were so many other people breaking their backs on that show, making it as good as could be so many writers, so many, uh, so many production people, so many actors. And, then, and, and that trickles down to guys like me who just, you know, were affected by that work and loved it and wanted to also contribute to it. I'm not ready to say you shouldn't read my books because it turns out Joss Whedon is an asshat. And that, I think that's fair. And it's, it's, I mean, it's different than if it was just absolutely 100% of his work, like a novel or a recording artist where it's just their voice and just their work. It's willing to say, it's difficult to separate the art from the artist, but this is not the art and the artist because everything in, in, in television is, is the work of a community. Yeah. And to throw away all of their work because of that guy being less than than ideal, I don't think that's fair to so many other people who work so hard on. So I remain I remain proud of the work I did on, on the Angel stuff. And I can go back and I can watch the stuff from, from Buffy and Angel and enjoy it and not feel like I shouldn't because it wasn't just him. So yeah. uh, I, I think I think that's the only way you can deal with it. 
Yeah, it's 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 actually easier for me to forget about things like his X Men, where it's a bit more of a directly him. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, very much. Where it's it's it's, it's it, but even then, I mean, you look at it, that 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 was him and Cassidy, right? Yeah, that's some good. Cassidy had some great stuff Cassidy on there. There's some stuff there I like. Yeah, and and even then, it's that 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 too is a community work. There's the editor, there's there's the anchor and letter. There are people helping him make that. It's not all work of one of one person. You you did uh, adapt three. I mean, three of the most loved episodes of that show. Yeah, yeah. almost so. almost four. We had one. We had one more that were that would that we that Elena and I had been assigned to do, and we 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 did a, a four part uh combined cover for it and i had written the first script and then they it? called it, i it was it was for the i forget the title now it was the angel episode where angel briefly becomes angelus again oh and it was the one with the one with the one where where uh, where willow came back yeah and, and faith shows up yeah and we had written and I, I got to write new scenes for it like i did with the others it was good it was gonna be fun and we we uh, we and all and I want to manage to do all the covers in advance because we were doing a, a four part mosaic cover, and then we got the call that like sales on the last one were just below the point where it made sense to keep doing it, so they they canceled it. But I still got paid for the first script, and the original art for those covers is in my hallway, so I came out okay on it. Oh well, that would have been fun because uh, mm-hmm. Angel and Faith were my favorite duo mm-hmm. in that in that universe. Uh- Blake, and I feel like that was an, an unexpected thing in that universe, too. It's like the moment. I, I don't think that was right. planned either. Yeah, it, that, I think that was a in big part. They did it because the, the, I feel like they did it because the actress was free. And all of a sudden, you had this chemistry between the two that worked out great. That was a great stuff. And it's not, ne- it's not even necessarily romantic or sexual chemistry. It's just mm-hmm. like these are two people and they're in the exact same spot. And they're the only two people who understand each other. Yeah. And they played out really well. Really that, would, cool. that would have been fun to do. Yeah, that's too uh, that, bad. That, that, that has to go in my in in my oh well file. <laughs> what other things are in your oh well file? Oh, I can't talk about some of those. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> Let us talk oh. about something that you absolutely can't talk about, though. That thing on your shirt. Starman. Starman. Historically, unbelievably underrated. Yes, true and or false? One hundred percent true. I I would say the best comic of the 90s the best comic of the 90s that is a tall I, I, order absolutely i'll I, I put it I put it out there 100 the best comic of the night and and the fact that the only other comic i can think of that got close to doing what it did is is gabe and sandman yeah in that robinson got to got to tell his own story all the way through and got to end it on his terms and then somehow through some miracle convinced dc to let him have his character and leave him alone and so no one else could come in and ruin jack knight after he was gone that never happens he hasn't appeared once i think he showed up in identity crisis for like a panel and and it was brief i I think i think you did yeah you did see him at sue dibney's funeral i mean it was a dude with black hair and a jacket it i guess it could have been anyone (laughs) Yeah, it, it could have been. And I was like, well, maybe. But it mean, also it's like, dude, you're at a funeral. Wear a suit and tie. <laughs> Don't wear the little jacket. Come on. Show some respect. That's not even a uniform. I'll oh, buy the whole superheroes get to wear their uniforms to a funeral, but you're wearing a leather jacket and a, and, a, and a 50 shirt. No. But yeah, I mean, no one's got, no one has had the chance to come along and ruin Jack Knight. Like it's happened to almost every other DC character at some point or other. Yeah. And that character was. It, it felt like it, it just hit the it hit the 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 comics world at just the right time where there was room still to combine old school pre-crisis DC nostalgia with um, uh, generation X slash generation Y malaise and I don't know what I'm doing with my life. And I'm a young guy with no goals and combine all that and then just tell this huge wide ranging story. And then you got to do what no one else does. You got to create a, a DC city. You know, the, 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 that's always been kind of my divider line from Marvel and DC is, you know, Marvel, Marvel's real world. They're in there. I mean, other than Latveria and Wakanda, 
if, if it's in Marvel, you can find it in Atlas. But DC, you had Gotham, you had you had Metropolis, and you had Star City, Coast and you City. had Midway City, and you had Coast City, Central and, he, and he Keystone, created, and Keystone City, and, you, and he created Opal City, and he created that city has such an identity to it. That city has and, more of an identity than any of the ones you mentioned, including really, Gotham City. I, yeah, no, it really does because Gotham City changes so often. So sometimes it'll be it'll be the uh, the the Dick Spring Gotham City of giant typewriters and then we'll go to be like the anton first michael keaton tim burton gotham city of, of, of super overdone spires and then they'll switch to the christian bale pittsburgh gotham city have you seen so, the, yeah. have you seen the batman i have seen the batman that's just new york it's it really literally new york. just new york <laughs> it's totally just new york <laughs> but anyway yes opal city well but opal city, opal city is amazing and yeah, there's just everything about about Starman. And he got to tell the entire life of what I what I would say is one of the great DC characters from beginning to end. And then he got to walk away. It's unbelievable. I, I need to do another another Starman reread. It's been about, it's been about probably like uh, four or five years. I'll do that. that. Yeah, I'll, I'll say he got to tell two entire lives because Ted and Jack. Both. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And he, he brought so much dimension to Ted Knight because Ted Knight's character was, it was okay. all over the place. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes he was just a rich, a rich playboy who bought the, who bought the, um, the, the rod, the rod. And like Roy Thomas was a guy who liked to lean into that a lot. Roy Thomas would always have Ted Knight saying, Oh, I didn't even build this myself. I bought it. Do I deserve to be star man? So he really lead in that. But other times Ted Knight was really smart. And so you, you, the two didn't really coalesce. And what what uh, James Robinson did was was take that Ted Knight and take some of the stuff that didn't make sense or that had been established and just make it feel so real. Like I mean, I didn't realize until after the fact they they, they reveal kind of like between the lines and slowly talk about the fact that Ted Knight had had an affair with the first Black Canary. And then you go back and realize that there was like a four issue run of Red and Bull that was just Starman, Black Canary, and T Moss. Yeah, where it's so pretty obvious. Me, this is where that happened. And yeah. that's why he did that. But since I came to it backwards, it, it just felt it felt like somebody telling me something and then somebody else confirming it. It was yeah. great. And also, like, so they did all of that stuff, but they also did the other thing, which is just completely make up stuff, which is like Bobo Benetti when he shows up. Like oh. I swear that guy is a pre-existing creation, but he's not. Yeah, he's not at all. He's but not he's at all written in such a way that like you believe it. Hundred percent, you believe it. Amazing. And Amazing. also the way that 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 uh, he takes some of the uh, some of the twists and turns of the character that everyone had forgotten or wanted to forget, and he just and, and just wrings the pathos out of them. The fact the fact that that Jack's brother was a failed star man. And oh my God! By the end of the series, you love David Knight. Yes. And do. at the beginning of the series, he's a joke. First, yeah. you you see him get cut down like nothing in, in in the first few pages. And I remember when he appeared in the Will Payton Starman series, and then and in that series, he's portrayed as kind of like this buffoonish. Uh, he, he 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 feels like he deserves it. and He hasn't earned it. There's he's a not reason like you're not Starman. Yeah, exactly. Giving giving Will Payton, and then and then he brings back Will Payton. And, and Macau. And, 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 absolutely. And the way he brought back Will Payton, we're like, you get this flash and you realize Will Payton's still out there somewhere being tortured. And then he had the discipline to not come back to that for like, what? It was like two years, right? Yeah. Between when we first find out that Will Payton's alive and then they actually resolve that, it's over two years. Who has that kind of discipline in comics when you get to cancel tomorrow? It's crazy. Chris Claremont. Chris Claremont. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> but he also has a cast of thousands. So. Yeah, right. So he can do that. Yeah. But no, that, that the, the and I don't I kind of don't want to see anyone adapt Starban into film or TV. Just because oh, I don't think it, it could ever be done. I uh, but I am happy with the way stuff like Stargirl is taking some of those elements and using them in their series and using them well. So I don't mind it. And yeah. I'd rather see that than have somebody try and do Try and do uh, Robinson Starman and do it badly. Well, I feel like Jack is not even just a product of his time, 
but it's like even back then he was kind of a, a throwback. Yeah. So I feel like that would be weird to do. I don't know. Plus, yeah. well, I, also because so much of what makes Starman work is the notion of, and it used to be DC's strength was in the notion of legacy, that he was he was the next in the line of Starman, and that he was picking up his father's mantle. And as we get farther and farther away from the 1940s, you can't really tell that story realistically anymore. Yeah. Because of, just because of the way that as time passes. And it's a shame because I mean when I remember when I was really enjoying DC's output in the 80s and 90s, they leaned into that legacy thing hard, and for a time it was working so well. And it, it didn't mean that it erased the old characters because you had you had uh, um, the new Cal Rayner stepping in for for Green Lantern, but then they they managed to bring back Hal Jordan that still works. You had Wally West as the Flash. Wally West was the first to to fulfill the promise to take up the legacy. And you saw with Connor Hawk, who I thought was a great character. And even when they brought Green Arrow back to life, it didn't make it didn't diminish Connor Hawk. And DC has so much of that legacy going on in a way that Marvel never has. That when they when they blew it all up for the New Fifty Two, I was so upset. And that kind of, I kind of stopped reading DC from that point. But I have to also admit that you know, as we all get older, you can't keep doing that legacy stuff unless you actually age your prime characters. And they're never going to do that. Yeah. You know, and yeah, I, I, I think they were trying to and then uh, recently and then they got blown up at the last minute. Yeah, they, that was their whole strength until until Miles Morales showed up and then Marvel was like. <laughs> yeah, Mar 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 Marvel took a different, a different way about it, though, which I didn't mind. I mean, a lot of the comments, I'm not, I, I, I didn't dig as much, but like I like what I liked about Miles Morales. Nothing about Miles Morales diminished Peter Parker. Yeah. Absolutely, and and both the Peter Parker of his universe, and when they crossed the river with our with our with the with the, the prime Peter Parker, and, you know, you never you never had a sense that this character was was making the original look like less than when it should. That that's always my my my, my biggest uh, complaint. That's that's why I can't stand the new Star Wars movies. Oh, I I mean, when I saw the first Star Wars movie, you're supposed to not two, like Star Wars, Scott, because you're a Trekkie. Oh, you know, it's, it's the rules. That. I love Star Wars so much. I, I'm, I'm such I'm such a Star Wars kid, and so when I saw when I saw The Force Awakens, I love the new characters. I thought Ray was great. She's cool. She's exciting. I thought Finn was interesting. The whole Stormtrooper thing. I thought the uh, um, Oscar Isaac Paul was great. Yeah. But then all they, they go out of their way to make all of my original Star Wars characters failures. Han and Leia are terrible parents. And Luke runs away the first time of trouble and, and hides and never comes back. Why do you do that? Why why can't why can't we have both? Why can't you have them, you know, doing what they should be doing, being the characters that we've come to see? But you know, they're now older, so they're not they're they're not the front of the fight because their new characters were great. They didn't need the old ones to to be destroyed to make them work. Do you think people said that about Starman back in the day? Like, for example, like Oh, you, why did you make Ted Knight a cheating, a cheating husband? You know, like, no, see, I, they didn't. I think because Robinson is such a good writer that when you find that out, you find that out through the lens of you know, seventy or eighty year old, incredibly remorseful, yeah, uh, Ted Knight looking back on his life, and you don't see it in such a way where he comes across as a bad guy. And you when know, Jack finds out about it too, he's like, "Yeah, the world is complicated." Yeah, yeah because, and, and because it is, and that's fair. And people people make mistakes, and people do things. But no, it's, compared to the way Star Wars just mangled Luke and Han and Leia, it's so. And here's the best example of that: is the way that the Ghostbusters handled it. Ghostbusters had new kids as the Ghostbusters, and they're great, all of them, especially Phoebe. She's fantastic. And the Ghostbuster, the, the the original Ghostbusters come in at the end, but they don't save the day 100% themselves, but they're also treated with respect. These are the OG Ghostbusters. They know what they're doing. They didn't make them look bad to, to try and comparatively make the new guys look great. Mm. You could have done that with Star Wars so easily, and for some reason they did. So I'll tell you something. Um, I'm getting back to Starman a little bit. 
I was, I'm also a big Roger Stern fan. So my star man was Will Payton. Will Payton. I, I bought every issue of that. So when Jack Knight started coming out, I said, I'm not reading this. This is bullshit. <laughs> right? This is bullshit. My star man is Will Payton. And then I started reading your column about, and I was living in the States at the time, but I was about to come back to the Philippines. And I started reading your column and you said, I get to the point where Will Payton comes back. And I was like, well, shit, now I got to get this book. <laughs> no, no, I got to read it back. <laughs> and then I'm about to fly back to the Philippines and there's no collections of Starman whatsoever. And whatever collections there are are out of order because DC is terrible at collecting stuff. Yeah. So I go on eBay and I buy the whole series. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about a gamble. And I'm like, is this going to fit in my ba- bag going back home? Yeah. <laughs> and it, it did. No, 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 but no, no. What if I hate it? <laughs> like, what if I hate it? You know what? Who cares? Boom. Yeah. And then, boom, it's one of my favorite comics of all time. By the way, a year after that, they announced the Omnibus Collections. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that sounds like DC. It's so annoying. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, that was uh, – so that was great. Uh, thank you for – Thank you for Comics 101, but very, very specifically for your coverage of Starman. That was well, that's awesome. That's great. Yeah. I'm not, see, now, I'm not, now I'm gonna go back and dust those off and run those again for the next few weeks. <laughs> Plus, I'm gonna go to my library and dig out those omnibuses and start reading those again because I definitely need to reread. Yeah, we haven't even talked about uh Tony Harris and Peter Snearberg on that, yeah, on that Tony, book. yeah, both those guys. So good. Yeah. Because Tony Harris is doing that thing that I don't think a lot of people were doing. It's like, you know, like doing the thing with Ted's glasses where he's actually adjusting them. Yeah. Like small. So, small much, so much body language. So much acting. Yeah. 100%. Amazing. Amazing. Let's talk about other recommendations. Let's say um, a fan comes up to you coming from the movies. It doesn't matter which movies. If it's DC, Marvel, The Crow, or whatever. Um, the Crow. Uh, if you were to say all right here's five comics to you know to kind of whet their appetite into the larger world of comics not 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 current stuff but just but back in the collections anything just off the top of your head Uh, just to make them fall in love with the medium what would it be Mm, that's that's tricky that is tricky because so much of the good stuff of the silver age to today's reader comes across as kind of stilted. So, I mean, and once, once people kind of get acclimated into comics then they can dive back into it. Um, I would say, and this is this, I still, I still think this one, even in the wordy as it is, holds up. Give them Dark Phoenix Saga for X-Men. Because now everyone knows X-Men and they're familiar with those characters, but they don't know why people love those characters so much. And Dark Phoenix will tell them that. So I would they say don't I would know why it. they keep adapting Dark Phoenix. Yeah, over and over again. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> exactly. And let's be honest, those Dark Phoenix adaptations aren't good. So, like, to a casual viewer and, like, w- yeah. watching those movies, like, why do they keep using this story? It's not good. Yeah. <laughs> this is why, right here. Uh, I would say that. I would say Kingdom Come. Mm. Because what Kingdom, what Kingdom Come does is it takes what everyone knows about, which is the Super Friends iconography of these are the super, the biggest superheroes in the world, and then plays with the notion of what if what if the super friends children were ungrateful bastards and didn't know what they were doing and that's that i mean every generation thinks the next generation don't know what they're doing so that that and and every younger generation thinks the older generation doesn't understand them so that connects to everybody so i i I would definitely throw that on the list um for avengers i would say if you could get it i don't think unfortunately you can't you can but that first that first uh eight 10 issues of Perez Busiek Avengers. The 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 first couple story arcs of that, which used to be in a nice slim trade, but now all you can do is get the giant anthology. I I throw that in there. Um you gotta gotta, you gotta have some Alan Moore. I think Watchmen, unfortunately. No, Watchmen holds up. I throw Watchmen in there. Because even between the film and the TV show, neither one of those capture what makes the book work so well. Yeah, I agree. So you got, I, I'd say you got to throw a Watchmen in there. And for a fifth, and I think this is going to, I would say this is a controversial pick because of what's become of the guy in later years. But the only reason anybody is still watching Batman movies right now is Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns. Mm. 
and you take that book out of some of the crazier stuff that, that Miller has done and said in the last few years and on its own in a vacuum, that book still really holds up. And yeah. so much of what both comics and movies think about Batman comes from that book. I would see you put Dark Knight, right? Dad put Dark Knight one? Right. It's Dark Knight or Year One? Uh, no, Dark Knight Returns, I think. Okay. Year One's close. Year One's really good. But Dark Knight Returns was really where everything that movies think Batman is came from. Absolutely. And then from there, you can go back and, and kind of delve into other really good Batman stuff. Yeah, it's all, it only gets controversial because, like, the thing the thing is, like, I read both Watchmen and Dark Knight back to back. And, like, Dark Knight being read after Watchmen is kind of a jarring experience. So I can see I, that. I didn't quite get it. And then somebody, because I was like, this doesn't feel real. I was like, this doesn't feel realistic to me. Batman is talking like a professional wrestler uh, and, and all of that. And then somebody said to me, just imagine it as somebody having fun with making comics. Right. And, and that's when it clicked for me with Frank Miller. And then, you know, I go on Twitter to talk about it like a few weeks ago. And I'm like, all right, this is when it clicked for me. Once I see Frank Miller through this lens, it makes sense. And, you know, I mean, again, I think it's unfair to judge the work of a man in his younger period by what he's become. That's not, that's not cool. And, and if you look at, if, if you look at a dark Knight, there's the, what you're talking about with the way Batman talks, where, he, where he's got the mutant leader. You understand, boy, it's an operating table and I'm the surgeon. And I, that, that, that is, there's, there's a fun to it that, I, that, that people will miss because this book, it kind of inadvertently trained everyone to think Batman has to be serious. And yeah. he's not being that serious in the book. No, I mean, like, they're, they're, do you know who I am, punk? Yeah, and there are some crazy, funny, dark moments, like when Joker is running out of the tunnel of his love with a battering in his eye, and he's like, hey, he's a goddamn maniac. <laughs> and, and there's a similar thing was with um, Watchmen, where people don't understand, and I think all comics kind of took this left turn where they got Watchmen wrong because they thought Rorschach was a hero. Yeah. Rorschach's a sociopath. Yes. <laughs> You're not, I mean, I mean, you can in your darkest places sympathize with him when he occasionally does something that is vengeful for, on the right side of things, but he's nobody to emulate, and you shouldn't be making all of your comics feel like Rorschach. He's a horrible person. He's a horrible, a horrible person. Man. He's a horrible person. And just because he occasionally does the right thing, it's still a horrible crime he does. <laughs> so yeah, and people miss I think people misunderstand a lot about that about Watchmen. Yeah, just because there's one person in that book who is more horrible than he is doesn't make him a not horrible person. Yes, yes. And but 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 again, I mean, and this is where I can't discredit Snyder for it because Snyder is just following the book. I think I think Watchmen is one of Snyder's best films. I think Snyder's problem, honestly, is a lot of the time he doesn't have a good sense for plot and he doesn't really understand what a hero is. Mm. And Watchmen is all about not understanding what a hero. is. And he, and as far as the plot goes, he follows that book pretty much chapter and verse. So, so, and because he does such a good job of like the, the famous scene with Watchmen in the prison cafeteria, you're locked up in here with me. That scene plays fantastically on screen, but it also makes you really sympathize with Rorschach and think he's a hero, and he's not. No. So that, and and so, but even with all that, I think there's 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 so much depth to to Watchmen. There's so much in the way Moore and Gibbons, and Gibbons doesn't get enough credit for this. No, he doesn't. The way Moore and Gibbons use the language of comics to tell their story in a way that no one ever has since. Especially if you, if you, if you've seen them talk about how they broke down, you know, the creative process. Gibbons does a lot in that book. Yeah, like he's the one who came up with like you know things like the electric tanks, the. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of details about the world, a lot of the background details, all, all the, of the stuff. All that world building. Yeah. Absolutely. And also just just the way, and I think this is both of them, the way they so faithfully adhere to the nine-panel grid. Mm -hmm. Even when a page is not a nine-panel page, there's still elements of a nine-panel grid to it. And it, it, you still read like a nine-panel grid. And no one's really done that ever since. It's amazing. There are certain sequences in that book, actually, where, for me, you could read it across the two pages. 
Yes. And it's yes. insane. It's insane. Yeah. Now, Moore got even better with that later on. He was doing he, – he, Moore was breaking all those rules insanely on stuff like Promethea. Yeah. Later on. Which I – Promethea, I love as an academic work, but I didn't ever really connect to it. It's a great book. I, I, I enjoyed reading it. I, I think it's – what he did with it is masterful. But I don't, it doesn't click with me the way like something like Tom Strong does, where he goes back to where it really kind of like he, he indulges in his own inner nostalgia. And every issue of Tom Strong feels like a book I've read my entire life, even though I've never seen it before. I can That's another that. one that, that needs a big, a big fat um, omnibus. It's all just, just more all the Tom ABC Strong. stuff. All the yeah, ABC it stuff. is. That's true because I mean, there wasn't, the, there wasn't a the bad book in that bunch. Top 10 was amazing. Yeah. Um, the oh those the, what was the one that he and rick veitch did in america's gray best shirt. gray shirt isn't it's just the, the fact that two guys can sit down and go okay we're gonna tell some will eisner spirit stories and just do a month after month it's unreal that they pulled that off yeah it, it's a it's a weird thing right because if you look at will eisner's spirit stories not all of them live up to the standard of what you think a Will Eisner right. story right. is, because that's just by, that's just going to happen. And because and because the guys are on a newspaper schedule, he yeah. was writing those suckers out every Sunday for the papers. Come hell or high water, he had to have a new one, so they weren't all going to be great. Yeah. So Moore and Veach, when they were doing Gray Shirt, it was like, all right, let's take the best stuff yeah. from. But let's not only do the good ones. Let's <laughs> only do the good ones. Do that. Yeah, it's the it's same amazing. thing. I feel the same way about Busek Paris Avengers because it's like, you know, as much as I love the previous Avengers runs, they get to do classic with the eye of like, oh yeah, we're doing classic. So like, let's not put Star Fox in this. Right. right. Yeah. I kind of like Star Fox, unfortunately, but he, he's not a character who has been well served and his character, much like, much like Joss Whedon, Star Fox's character does not go well looking through a modern lens. No, oh, I was really surprised when they introduced him into the MCU. Yeah, I was, like, that was, I was too. But yeah, luckily, let's do it in the movie no one's going to see. <laughs> did you watch it? Did you watch Eternal? Yeah, it was the first movie what? I saw back in theaters. So What did you think? I think it was helped a lot by being the first movie I saw back in theaters. That's fair. I, I, I watched it. I didn't, that one did not make my theater cut. Shang Chi did, Spidey did. Eternal, Eternal's like, no, nah, I can wait now. So I, no. I watched it at home. Shang Chi theaters were not open for Shang Chi. Yeah. So. Well, l- luckily in LA, they were doing things where you could rent out a theater for relatively cheap, and yeah. so we just rented out theaters. So it was just ten of us in a theater watching Shang Chi. It was great. Well, with Spider Man. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you, it got the biggest yeah. reaction at my theater, and I'm pretty sure that's true of the whole country. <laughs> When Ned's grandma starts talking, because she's <laughs> Filipino, oh. we're, we're all like, oh, my God. That was great. That was so good. That That's was great so speech. awesome. Here's a, here's a funny thing, Scott. She's clearly not a Filipino speaker. <laughs> not at all? No, not at all. We're like, oh, she has an accent. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't great. get somebody who was an actual speaker. <laughs> <laughs> but somehow that makes it more adorable. Yeah, that's that's awesome. But though with with Eternals, what I felt about Eternals was Eternals felt to me like being invited to an absolutely gorgeous cocktail party or dinner party where you don't know anybody. So you feel like you should like it because it's so nice, the food is good, the ambiance is amazing, but you can never relax because you don't know anybody here and you never connect with them. Mm. I never connected with the, any of the characters in Eternals. It looked great. The effects were beautifully rendered. I, I, I could see the way the story worked, and it worked, it worked satisfactorily, but I never cared. I think I liked it enough. <laughs> yeah, but I wouldn't like, say, watching I wouldn't say it, it once bad. would be my thing. Yeah, I wouldn't say it was bad, but it's not going to be a movie I go back to. Yeah. And also, yeah. I mean, there's also, in terms of the casting, I mean, I don't know about you, but I think what always makes salma hayek so appealing on 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 screen is is when she's funny and when she's sexy and when she kind of like just kind of clicks with the character and it's happy and you and you have a high of emotions and she's just played so damp down you never get it you never get any any sort of like emotion good or bad out of her she just everything is so muted and the yeah. same same for angelina jolie 
when Angelina Jolie is kind of allowed to like, you know, break the chain, she can be great, but she never does. Yeah. I, well, the kicker I, I like most was Dane Whitman, and we barely saw it. I have a friend who basically said the problem with Angelina Jolie's character is that in that in that movie is Angelina Jolie playing a troubled woman is clearly Angelina Jolie playing a troubled woman. You never buy that it's a troubled woman because it's yeah. Angelina Jolie. You're right. I think that's totally that's totally true. It didn't. It, I I never I never bought into the character. I feel, so I feel that. Yeah. What but, did you, you know, think of No Way Home? Although, I'm sorry. What did you think of No Way Home? Oh, No Way Home was No Way Home was so good. It made me like other Spider-Man movies I didn't like in the past. You're talking about Andrew Garfield's and in aspects of Spidey Three. I wanted to go back and watch more of Spidey Three to go to go see Sandman again. Mm. And because I, I haven't watched Spidey Three since I saw it in the theaters because I, I didn't. It was bad. Of, <laughs> it was. It was. Like, it wasn't good. There was. There were good parts. You could tell that the parts that were good were the parts that Raimi liked which was Sandman, but everything else was not good because you could tell it had been forced on him. But yeah, and then like, I, 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 saw, I saw the first Amazing. I never saw the second. But when I walked out of the theater, I liked Garfield so much, I went home and I bought Amazing 2 on Amazon. I know I'm not, it's not going to be great, but I want to see more of his Spidey now. Yeah, I felt so vindicated because I always... Andrew Garfield has, like, ever since the first his first movie, has been my favorite Spider-Man. I know the movies aren't great, but he's so good as Spider-Man. Yeah. yeah. And I think that scene where the three of them meet for the first time, he's clearly also, I think, the best actor. Yeah, I think so too. And the um what and what I really loved about it is you can tell there was a, an intention by the creators to kind of give not just his Spider-Man a moment of redemption. But to give Garfield that moment of redemption, it's like he should have been a great Spider-Man and he wasn't given the tools. And they wanted to give him that moment. And they did. It was so great. And then just the fact that they, I, I didn't expect them to bring back all the villains, which they did. Yeah. And it was seeing everyone back was great. It's the close we got to a true Sinister Six. And just, I don't know. You know, I there mean, were six villains in that movie, Scott. Yeah. The sixth one <laughs> just didn't show up to the fight. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true. I mean, they made me like Ned in this movie because I hated Ned, especially in the first one. Really? I couldn't stand Ned. Oh, man. I, that movie just bugged me. This shit comes to be Ned coming. There's so much Ned in it. What are you doing? And then the second one, he was more for a straight Congo relief, so I liked it better. But in this one, he's really good. They gave him good stuff to do that I believed in. That was fantastic. You know what was funny is, um, so I'm just going to say it. Filipinos believe in magic. To some to whatever extent right so when ned starts doing the thing uh i know some some of my non-filipino friends were like oh how did he suddenly know how to do that and i was like i'm completely fine with this <laughs> yeah <laughs> i was gonna say uh, do, do you do you think that was intentional do you think they knew that about about filipino culture and decided to incorporate it no because i think multiverse of madness was supposed to come out first and yeah, that's true m- maybe i don't know what was going to happen with this one i think Wong was supposed to do something or whatever, but but then they just decided to, to run with Ned and make it a joke. And I'm like, yeah, like you know, some people have can do weird stuff. Like I don't know. Yeah. No, and, and I mean, it, it still made sense all on universe. He, he he couldn't do it without the sling ring. Yeah. So I mean, it still made sense in terms of of the the way. And I love the way even Doctor Strange gives him this kind of like grunt of approval, like, oh, you did that, well done. And then he just literally lets it go. He didn't give him a a little speech or anything. When he opens the portal for the first time, his grandma says the word salamanquero, which means mystic, (laughs) mystic magic person. (laughs) That's great. So, you know, that that word exists for a reason. (laughs) That's so cool. No, the other thing I loved about No Way Home was the thing I haven't liked. uh, I thought whenever they've used Spider-Man in the Avengers movies and Cap movies, he's been great. But in his own movies, and they got better in the second one. I just, this, but my biggest problem with Homecoming was that Spider-Man, that Peter Parker was just a jerk. He didn't mm. care about anything but being an Avenger and his and 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 his own self-interest. He didn't feel like there's no, he's not guilt-ridden. He didn't feel like Peter Parker to me. I mean, what this movie did was, whether by intentionally, if they were always planning it, or it just worked out well. All three movies are his origin story to being Spider-Man. 
And we got the Uncle Ben moment. It just became now it's the Aunt May moment. Because I mean, I understand why you didn't want to do Uncle Ben again after the first two tries. And I'm glad they didn't do it in Civil War. And instead, they actually held it for here where it matters. Yeah. And we got we saw the Uncle Ben moment, the great responsibility moment with Aunt May, and it works just as well. And now it pays off the last two movies where he was coming to this point. I mean, I don't know if it's intentional genius filmmaking, but it was genius filmmaking. I feel you. I get what you're saying, but as a '90s kid, I am really sad that they killed off Marissa Tomei. Oh yeah, I was. I, I was too because she was a great Aunt May. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people don't like it. <laughs> yeah, surprisingly but... good. Aunt. I mean, whenever they first said, "Like, wait, Marissa Tomei is Aunt May," but she came into it so well, and she made it her own. I loved it. Yeah, and I, like a lot of people don't like it because they want Aunt May, Aunt May to be like you know old. But I'm like, yeah. I'm like as an uncle myself. <laughs> Like that is the Aunt May that I relate to the most. Yeah, no, no, that that's a big part of it too. Is as as we all get older, those kind of points do do, do shift in time, and so. But also, I mean, it it also played off of Bendis's Ultimate Spy, which had a more youthful Aunt May. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Bendis's Bendis's Aunt May wasn't Marissa Tomei, but still, it, it it was moving toward that. Closer to Sally Field and the, the yeah, movie. yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Scott, what else are you working on? I mean, right now, I'm, I'm, I, we're just finishing up issue eight of Star Trek The Mirror War, which is our big, gigantic, uh, epic scale Mirror Universe uh, saga. It's been so much fun. Um, can't go wrong got, with The Mirror Universe. Can't go wrong with The Mirror Universe. And it is, the Mirror Universe is so much fun just because, and I love writing all kinds of Star Trek, but there's always, when you're writing Star Trek, you, you feel this obligation to adhere to Roddenberry's code. It's, you gotta follow the ethics. It's gotta be a utopia. I think Jonathan Frakes always has a quote he says about it. When he asked, he asked Roddenberry, what's the future like? And, he, and Roddenberry tells Jonathan Frakes, there ain't no hunger and there ain't no greed and all the children know how to read. And so that's kind of, when you're writing your Star Trek stories, you can't have jerks. You can't, so you can't have people be, be, be assholes a lot. You can't have people have, have um, sinister ambitions. It's tough to write that a lot of times. It takes away a lot of your motivation. And, but then when you get to dip your toe in the mirror universe, all that's out the window. And people can be the worst they can be. And people can, can follow their ambitions to horrible places. And then you get to, but you get to take the characters that everybody knows, like Picard and Riker and Jordy and, see what they're like placed in this environment and it's just so much fun to write and hopefully so much fun to read people seem to like it it's it's great it's really and then i do this for a couple of years and then i start aching to go back to to roddenberry's trek again and i get to write some real trek and i feel good about myself for a while until i get bored with it very cool anything else down the pipe um that's what we're there's always there's always things in always in motion is the future says yoda there's always things happening but nothing i can talk about yet all right very cool thank you scott this has been great i uh, you know come back anytime I would, I would love to do this again any chance any chance to talk to talk classic marvel and dc i'll do it all day uh any words that you want to say to fans of i don't know george george perez um We've all gotten this chance right now, and most of us ever never get this chance. You can you can tell him how you, how much his work has meant to you, and if you do it, whether a message or a post on a, on a Facebook post or on a, 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 on Twitter or somewhere, the fact that you get to do it, you should do it because his work has meant so much to all of us. His work has made a huge difference in my life. All of us can ask is that when we leave this place, we leave it a little better than we found it. I'd like to think I have. I think we'd all think that. And we all know Perez has. And just, just telling him how much his work has meant to you is worth the world. Do it if you can. Absolutely. Thank you, Scott. Thanks a lot.